Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Alan Thompson. I teach uh, journalism here at Carleton and I'm the director of something called the Center for Media and Transitional Societies, which is a research center uh, in the School of Journalism. Uh, Syria is very much a transitional society. It's uh, probably in the wrong place in that transition, but it's in transition. And for journalists, it's a pretty interesting place to observe. I think for journalism students, we can probably learn uh, a lot of bad lessons about journalism, I would argue, in the way Syria is being covered right now. It's not being covered very well at all, uh, but I guess there's the usual excuse that it's a very difficult environment in which to work. Uh, the regime doesn't exactly make it easy, I guess, for journalists to cover this story. But I do wor worry a bit that are we interested enough, are we trying hard enough, are we paying enough attention? Uh, we don't very often hear from people who practice journalism in Syria. We hear, I think, mostly from European journalists who have managed to go to Syria. So uh, tonight we are very lucky to have a, a kind of a double feature. A couple weeks ago, uh, Paul Watson from the Toronto Star was here speaking about his work primarily in Afghanistan. But uh, Paul had also mentioned to me that he had recently been in Aleppo uh, reporting for the Toronto Star and had had the chance to meet this very interesting journalist who was working on the ground uh, in Syria, in Aleppo, uh, Yasser al-Haji, who had worked for a state-run media and, and then found himself in this position where he couldn't do that any longer and is now involved with the opposition to the Assad regime, but is also still a journalist, is still a witness to the conflict, is uh, tweeting frantically, uh, covering events, but also finds himself in a position where he is facilitating other journalists. He's helping others to try and understand what's going on in Syria. So I wanted to ask uh, Paul, who really introduced me to, to Yasser, if he could introduce Yasser to you and explain a little bit about uh, who he is and, uh, and the kind of work that he sees him doing. And then we'll ask uh, Yasser to talk to us about his work I guess it's some media find it hard to define uh, whether you're a journalist or an activist these days. A uh, media outlet in town was interested in talking to Yasser and then changed their minds. Uh, they thought, well, he's an activist, not a journalist. So uh, even more reason for us to hear from him and talk about that interesting transitional place for journalism in, a, in a, an environment like Syria. So I'll, I'll ask uh, Paul Watson, who is one of Canada's most celebrated war correspondents, writers about conflict, who is, in his, is himself in a, in a bit of a transition in terms of how we should be doing journalism, how should we should be covering environments uh, like Syria. So I'll ask Paul if he can uh, give uh, Yasser a, a proper introduction, and then we'll turn it over to Yasser, and then we should have lots of time uh, for questions and answers. And just, just so you know, uh, we are recording this event. We now record these uh, occasions in the School of Journalism. We have a team that does that on the record. And then we post them to YouTube uh, later on. So you can check the Faculty of Public Affairs YouTube channel uh, later on for a, a record of this event. So, Paul. Okay. If you don't mind, I'll remain seated. I'm not going to speak long anyway. Or should I go there? Maybe Better roll a bit closer oh, just okay. so you're more audible. Real quick. I'll, I'll go here. Um, the, uh, because this question came up in a previous session, I'll begin my introduction with this point. I was asked by journalism students, how do you find so-called fixers, the term that we use for people like um, Yasser, that is foreign people like me who don't speak the local language or know how to move around safely. We reach out to local experts, who we call fixers, who interpret for us and try to keep us alive. Um, in Yasser's case, I, uh, I met him because I had spent months lobbying my bosses uh, for permission to go to Syria. They were against it for a number of reasons, uh, part of which is cost, because of insurance costs and that sort of thing. They didn't want me to get kidnapped or killed. Um, I finally persuaded them that we should do this because their number one question was, who's your fixer going to be? They, they wanted to be assured as best they could that we could trust that I'd be in the hands of someone who would keep me from getting kidnapped. 
Now that's impossible to assure, but that's how they think. Um, in order to get the best person I could possibly uh, get, I reached out to um, a colleague who I knew had done excellent work in Syria, uh, a photographer named Moises Saman, who works with a legendary Magnum photo agency uh, on contract with the New York Times. Uh, and I said, um, uh, uh, I, think, I think when he met you, he was working for the New Yorker. Um, the, uh, I just emailed him and I said, uh, Moises, you, you did great stuff in Syria. Who did you work with? He said, Yasser Haji. Here's his email address. So I emailed Yasser and I said, uh, you know, I work for the Toronto Star. I'd like to do what you did with Moises. Um, can you help me? And he said, sure, I can help you. So the, I got a bunch of more questions from my boss is saying, well, why should we trust this guy and how do we know? Uh, so I answered all their questions. I asked Yasser questions. He answered nicely. Uh, and they were eventually convinced. The Yasser is unique uh, in the world of fixers because he is a real journalist. Oftentimes fixers are taxi drivers or English majors or things other than journalists. Um, you know, uh, Yasser worked for a state-run newspaper under the Assad regime. Uh, was a UN uh, correspondent for how many years? Seven years, based in New York, uh, reporting on the UN for the regime, uh, and then ended up in Cyprus, I believe. And then, come the revolution, he, like many good-minded Syrians, thought, I have to make a choice. He went with the opposition. Once you join the opposition in what is now a civil war, you, by definition, have a point of view. Um, so, yes, He's a journalist, but he is also a member of the opposition. I don't see any contradiction in that, and we can discuss the nuts and bolts of that because I, I happen to think that the way the world has changed, we need more activist journalists in Canada. I, I think that, that there's a great tradition of that in the West, and that we lost it for reasons of economics and finances, and that we should regain it, but we can have that discussion. Um, before I hand you over to the real expert, I want to put this in your mind. The, as I left uh, Syria on this, uh, this week-long visit and was back in southern Turkey, I bumped into a couple of old colleagues, and I was lamenting the fact that this nightmare was going on 24 hours a day and was getting worse, and there didn't seem to be any public pressure in the West, especially in Canada, uh, among Western countries, to do anything to stop it, apart from platitudes and sending some aid here, you know, food and medical supplies here and there. Uh, these journalists said, well, yeah, no one wants to get kidnapped. Because recently, uh, just you know, uh, a short time before this, Richard Engel, the, the number, uh, the chief foreign correspondent for NBC, had been kidnapped, but was then re uh, released, rescued, in fact, by the Free Syrian Army. Um, the, it was enough to say, yes, no one wants to be kidnapped, but then they said, besides, it's all on YouTube anyway. So th this struck me as something that I don't think most journalists in the West understand, and certainly not the broader public. The social media that we're all trumpeting so much these days has now become an excuse for Western reporters to stop taking the risks that we need to take in order to write the stories, do the coverage that mobilizes our governments to stop this kind of stuff. And for all of my life as a journalist, that's what journalists did. That's why I got interested in foreign reporting in the first place. You could make a difference. But we are retreating faster than anybody knows. And I think Syria is in the misfortunate position of being at the peak of the journalistic retreat. So now everyone says, We'll let the public watch it on YouTube, and meanwhile, our governments dither. And I'll hand you over to Yasser. I like to say salam alaikum in Arabic. Salam alaikum. That means these have been new and cannot be better than this. These have been new all of you, and these are Syrian and Syrian people. Uh, being a journalist in Syria, it's really a very challenging job. In the beginning, we used to demonstrate. We would go to demonstrate five, ten people. The only way we could show our demonstrations peaceful using cellular phone 
mobile phone to videotape the demonstration and after that upload it on YouTube. <coughs> Doing this simple things for you here in the West or in Canada, very simple things, for us was very challenging. And it's not only that, you could be a bit imprisoned, tortured, and even killed because you're using cellular phone to videotape a simple demonstration. Uh, informers, they can report you to the government. Government come to your house 3 o'clock in the morning, they will arrest you, they will torture you, and nobody knows how, what happened to you later. Uh, after that, things become more difficult. If you go on demonstration, the government has snipers. Anyone has a video, uh, mobile phone in his hand, they could shoot his hand or shoot his head and kill him. And that happened to too many people inside the Libra got killed or in Syria got killed because they were videotaping demonstrations. Uh, that's uh, I mean, simple things. In the West, it's very complicated because you kill when you work with dictatorship or when you deal with dictatorship. The Syrian revolution is about freedom and democracy to get rid of dictatorship. And unfortunately, the rest of the world stand still and watching the Syrian people get killed every day and doing nothing. So far in Syria, kill, around 80, 70 to 80,000 people got killed, and around 200,000 being in jail. Most of them, we don't know what will happen to them, or still they're still alive or not. And uh, if we talk to <coughs> any average guys in Syria in the beginning, okay, we like for no problem to talk to foreign journalists. After a while, they get upset. Can't take journalists to them anymore. Why you say, okay, we talk to journalists all the time. For two years being killed, no one asks about us. Why we should talk to journalists anymore? And some of the journalists are spies. That's true. Some journalists are spies, they make things complicated in a certain way. For example, when you, are, you put a video or you put a picture on an iPhone, and you transmit that picture back to your newspaper, the signal could be tracked by the government and know where the picture is being taken, they will hit that house in that night or in the morning by a big bomb and kill everyone inside. Uh, this is a uh, small things. What we talked about how you can be an activist and journalist. It's two different things. You can be a an, an journalist, being honest, reporting, criticizing everyone, criticizing whatever you see wrong. That's been your job as being a journalist. When the Frisian army made mistakes, we reported that, we criticized that. That's been part of being journalist. Being activist, that you're supporting the people that are fighting for their freedom and democracy. You cannot see someone fighting for his freedom, not to support him. And if you're talking about the truth, the truth of journalism, that's what it's all about. You report the truth, what's going on on the ground. But you talk about moral things. And when you demonstrate for freedom and democracy, that's moral. That's a very valid moral point. And you cannot support it. You cannot stay stand still and not support that. So being an activist and journalist sometimes does not really contradict each other or does not affect each other in a bad way. That's very simple things. <coughs> so, and anyone who wants to ask questions, I'm open to hear from you. Uh, since Paul spent a lot of time with you, and I don't know if anyone else in the room has been in Syria recently, uh, maybe you can start us off and guide us through a few questions, things that you you know yes or no, and that we should we should talk about, and then we can open it up to uh, anyone in the room. Um, I'll, I'll throw you a hard one first, um, because the uh, I'm of the opinion that. Even the reporting that is done by foreigners in Syria focuses on the conflict, but leaves out the, the dark sort of background. And that, by that I mean foreign intelligence agencies and how they are meddling in Syria and doing things which, uh, which prolong the conflict or um, making promises and not delivering on those promises. Such as, for instance, the CIA promising that weapons were coming last summer, and they never came. What what can you tell people about what goes on in, in those sort of dirty dealing um, that they may not be seeing in the newspaper? 
Um, unfortunately, and it's not really everyone care about freedom and democracy, especially when it comes to the relationship between countries. All everyone care about is interest. We don't care about the people. So when this country, for example, like the United States, CIA, or another intelligence, they will care about their back home, what they were supposed to do, their rating or their job back home. So when things really got tough in Syria, like the CIA or other intelligence agencies, they came and said, okay, we're going to deliver organs to you. Help us with some information. We provide that information and help them come. They will come 10 months, now, 10 days later or one month later, say the same thing. And the same things will keep us promises. It's not only CIA, it's other intelligence did that too. For example, we have one airport in Aleppo, in north of Aleppo, uh, which is the only base controlled by the government and still controlled by the government in the north of Aleppo. The Turkish intelligence, they came and said, okay, give us specific details about the airport. We're gonna help you and we're gonna <coughs> use our artillery to destroy that airport. We did provide them with the help they need, but they never, uh, they never helped us to target that airport or to, for us to be able to liberate this. So what um, I want to stress here, uh, the intelligence, they don't have moral, really. They care about their position and their job back home. They don't care that much about the people who get killed. Maybe if there sometimes people get killed, that's for their own interest, it's good. That's plain as that. Any questions that arise out of that, sir? There must be one question that <laughs> arises out of that. The, the cynicism of foreign intelligence agencies. The, the same thing, like, I don't think that, like, if I was a CIA agent or if I was a person who belongs to my country, um, I care about first what my country is going to do what should do. With. So, how could you actually go forward, go ahead and make sure or tell those CIA agents that? For example, if weapons went into Syria, they would not be misused. Or if weapons from our, our if, if, if they actually helped you mm -hmm. in, in the attack against the, um, the airport, um, you talked about what is it going to, like, how, how are you going to assure them that those weapons are not going to happen? Like, the same thing happened against them uh, when the whole uh, Soviet Union situation. So they gave the money and they gave the weapons, and the weapons were used against them, especially the Patriots. So, uh, and I'm Syrian, by the way, so I'm not really against it. I'm just, uh, I'm just, uh, I'm with the revolution. But I just want to have your opinion on it. Um, the, if they want, they want to help you, they will help you. If they want to find excuses, they always find excuses not to help you. Regarding the Patriot missile, for example, or the anti-aircraft, what we ask sometimes for anti-aircraft missile. The anti-aircraft missiles could very easy uh, control through technology. How long well, was within one month could be used after one month could be for the password being changed. It's a lot of things can do to control who has a weapon, when will be fired. But they choose not to do so just to keep us promises. And they say, excuse me, we'll go to Jabhat al-Nusra, to extremists. This is not true. So there are a way to control these things. But simply they don't want to help. Uh, when the conflict start, okay, after a few months, we went everywhere to say, okay, guys, the conflict, will, if we, the conflict will go down, we'll have more extremists, we'll have four fighters in our land because we're getting no help. People getting killed every day. And when you get killed every day and no one helps you, you will accept anyone else offer you help. It doesn't matter who he is. Even if he was prior, he was your enemy, and you, you are in so desperate need, you can accept his help. So, okay. They kept silence and they did nothing. Foreign fighters came into Syria. We accept them. We can't say no. Extremists become in Syria because they being pushed to the corner. When you isolate people or people get killed every day, they become more extreme. There's no question about that. And you cannot tell them why. They, they lost hope and they become extreme. And now we have foreign fighters. We have extremists. Now it's not too much. We still can deal with it. But their excuse now, all well, you have foreign fighters. You have extremists. You create, and now you blame us for it. How you can justify that? We told you, okay, this is what's gonna happen. We know it, we are on the ground, we see every day how it's happening. You did nothing, this is what you get the result. If this conflict in Syria goes on for a long time, for one more year, we'll have a lot more extremes. We'll have, maybe you see me extremes. I'm, I'm honest. I have one guy who used to work for me. 
The army attacked our town on April 2012. They went inside his house with a tank. He used to work with me. When he came back and he saw his house destroyed, he joined the FSA. He joined the Free Syrian Army. And a lot of people had the same things happen to them. When you use violence against people, you don't know what their reaction is. They will go to the other side. They will go to a more extreme to get back at you. That's the normal things to do. And this is what happened in Syria. We're talking about the word Tawheed. Okay. No, 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 but the foreign media does not go to report about the Syrian Free Syrian Army, go to foreign to report about Jabhat al-Nusra, unfortunately. And everyone see has a beard, they call him Jabhat al-Nusra or Jabhat al-Nusra. That's it. Come on. Be a journalist, okay? Talk to this guy, see what he's all about, ask him about his views. After that, report. Not see his long beard and see about him, that's his Jabhat al-Nusra. This is not journalism. That's doing your job, you have to do it right. And most journalists, they don't. I, just, I want to ask you about the journalism. Uh, the the work that you're doing, how do you do it? The nuts and bolts. What what are you what are you using? Are you using Twitter? Are you using YouTube? How are you documenting what you're seeing and getting that information to the wider audience? Uh, we used to go to Aleppo. Aleppo is 30 kilometers from my town. 30 kilometers. We need two hours to get to Aleppo. Was controlled by the government, so we need two hours to get to Aleppo. After that, we use a video symbol, video cameras, or mobile phone. We go back to the Turkish side to upload it, because we have no internet. After that, it takes us two hours to upload five minutes video. So this is how we used to do it. It's, it's not easy, but a lot of people also get killed, but it's how many cameras. And, uh, so this is most of the time how we used to do it. Now lately, it become a little bit easier, because the uh, area north of Aleppo to the Turkish side be liberated. So we have Turkish internet, we can do that. Or we use, some people help us, the satellite internet. So we use it now, it become more easy. And the government does not have the manpower to control everything. For example, in the beginning I used to work with journalists, was not, we are not allowing them to use BGAM. So now we are allowing to use BGAM because the government does not control that much anymore. It does not have resources to track these things. And I see you on Twitter. Are you using Twitter? We use Twitter, so we use Facebook. A lot. But how are you actually, what's the connection that you're getting? Are you Internet. doing it from your phone? You're doing your it from, phone. From, from a your cafe? Phone. Or? Your phone. Your phone. And the, the reason you don't do it from cafe, it's, uh, in the beginning was a lot of informants. Mm -hmm. So you don't go to a coffee shop and start doing that. You go to your own house or you go out in the field and you do that. If it's some more news, you have to uh, like secretly report the news. Because a lot of people, they will report the government, the government will attack your house 3 o'clock in the morning, beat up your wife or beat up your kids if they don't find you. So, using uh, Twitter is not too much, Facebook and YouTube all the time. Well, that sounds like journalism to me. Uh, any other questions? <coughs> Most people in Syria, they don't want intervention. They want to be able to protect themselves. For example, the worst things we now we get, uh, uh, fighter jet bombing us or user cluster, using cluster bombs. For, I want to bring to your attention cluster bombs, what the cluster bombs is. Cluster bombs, it's a barrel full filled with 48 small bombs. And the 48 small bombs has a lot of bombs inside this each one. So when the cluster bombs being used from here, we'll go two kilometers wide and will affect everyone within two kilometers. 
So this is a fact. We want something to use anti fighter jets so we don't use, they don't, cannot use, sorry, a cluster bomb against us. The other things, it's SCUD missiles. I want this also say to you. SCUD missiles, I have some pictures, maybe it's here or not. SCUD missiles, it's a 11 meters long missiles. If we'll hit one block, we'll destroy the total block, kill everyone inside and reduce it to rubble. The government been using that. And thanks to the NATO allies or the NATO or the Western world, they used Patriot missile. They didn't put it on the side of Turkey, on the border between Turkey and Syria. They put it 60 kilometers inside, so they cannot use it inside Syria. Because the limit for, for Patriot is 60 kilometers. So if they put it on the Turkish Syrian side, they can reach Aleppo and protect Aleppo. They didn't do that. They put it inside Turkish border, 60 kilometers. So they only can protect, they can protect the Turkish side. And so the government, of course, they knew that. And they're using SCUD missiles to kill people all the time. The whole of one SCUD missile is six, seven meters deep and 20 meters long. The hole they made. And it's, uh, according to the government, they're using SCUD missiles to fight terrorist armed group. So I'll leave it to you to believe that, that the government fighting terrorist armed terrorist group by using SCUD missiles and cluster bombs inside the city. You see here one side cluster bombs. I was in Aleppo one day, it was Friday. Friday people, they don't go to work, they stay home. They used cluster bombs inside the city to kill as much people as they can because they know the people are not going to work. They are on the street, kids are playing. They killed a lot of kids. Government criminal, they do criminal act of killing civilians. They don't care who they care, who they kill. Just as you're watching this, you'll see an image, one of your images, of just nothing but destruction on both sides of the road, as far as you can see. That's a scud. That's a scud. Sorry. I met one guy, sorry. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know if you have his pictures. He was standing there on one scud side. And he told me he lost 11 of his family, including his wife, his, his kids, and his, his wife was pregnant in one bomb. And they pulled him from underneath the rubble and his head had shrapnel all over him. This is how the government fighting first armed group. Citizen journalism, I think, is very good. But the problem with citizen journalists, they are not very accurate. Okay. For example, we say, we say okay, uh, if I want to listen to citizen journalist, I will question his accuracy, numbers, what you being used, how many being killed. So they will report, okay, one fighter jet attacked Mara. I am from Mara, for example. Sometimes it didn't attack Mara. We are flying by over Mara to go somewhere else. So. Uh, very good uh, intention, but it really has to be more professional. But the problem with serial citizen journalists is not very accurate. It's my own opinion. Otherwise, the, very good. The, um, this is my current obsession. So, pardon me if this sounds slightly cynical. It's not. To me, the, the best thing you can learn in professional journalism training in a school like this is not how to gather the information. That, you know, Pretty much anyone can do that. You ask a lot of questions, and you get tired, you keep asking more questions. And you tape it so you've got it accurate. The real challenge is to market, to get people to care, right? The, all the citizen journalists in, in Syria are doing absolutely incredible work. The, you know, if, if you haven't seen this, ask me afterwards, and I'll give you the link to it. There's a YouTube thing that was posted on the New York Times in their Watching the War web blog. Of, uh, all, you, all you see is a camera that's obviously on a tripod of some sort, and it's pointing through a hole from a shell blast or something in a wall. And you hear two people softly talking in the background. They're obviously citizen journalists, and they're not shooting or doing anything else. 
Then you hear a single gunshot and a bird flies up and a couple of more gunshots and then out of nowhere a T-54 tank is directly in front of that hole and the barrel is pointing right at it and then kaboom, kaboom, kaboom and nothing. People like that are dying every day shooting videos like that and tweeting and doing all that, but all the Western governments can just ignore it because it's not packaged right. There's no, as I've said earlier, there's no Christian Amanpour, to use the Bosnia Sarajevo example, to stand up live on TV in a town hall meeting with the President of the United States and say, Mr. President, when are you going to do something? That's the difference to me. one accident about one month ago. One guy from the AFP, the French news agency, report was a, a child soldiers being trained in one town. I heard the news from different sources. So I went to that town to look for this training camp as he claimed. I found nothing from that town. I spoke to the civil council of that town and said, we don't have any training camp here. I looked further down furthermore for this and I found an accident happened in the next village one guy, one father he lost his kids by fighter jet attack he got so upset he has another kid he was 15 years old he took him to train him and using clashing code. the journalists went there and photographed that father with his son and later he put in his news agency that was a training camp for children and some newspaper Lebanese newspaper, the Daily Star of Lebanon, they took that story from here, from that agency, and put it on their news. And after that, Syrian newspaper took it out. When I spoke to the Lebanese newspaper, why are you doing that? Did you make sure the story is credible? They said, no, we don't care. It's not our problem. Talk to AFP. I talked to the AFP. Why are you doing like this? Give me evidence. He said, no, you have to talk to our reporter. So there are some people, they do this intentionally to misreport things or to overlook something. And this is a fact that's very bad. I and mean, as an example, I told you, most of the free Syrian army now have peer. They don't care anymore about their look or what they eat or what they wear anymore. Because you, go, you, could, be die, you could die in a minute. When you are inside Aleppo, there are snipers, they are shelling randomly, a fighter jet, everything. Any time in Aleppo, you could get killed. Who will care about his beard or whatever he is wearing? Some, some journalists, they will go and take some pictures of some guys with beard, and they have black flag here, that's it, Jabhat al-Nusra. This is not Jabhat al-Nusra. We liberated the town of Azaz on 19th of July, 2011. I was there half an hour after I got liberated, and I saw black flag on the roof. And the journalist was next to me say, okay, this is Jabhat Nusra in the building. Jabhat Nusra wasn't even there. Some kids are 12, 10, 12 years old. They climbed up the roof and they put this flag. They say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. That common kind of things in Arabic to say, in Islam. And they reported that Jabhat Nusra liberated that town. So there are a lot of people, they really, they don't care. They won't just put sensation to their story. Maybe they get more money. And sometimes we, some, we discuss with journalists. I work with old kind of journalists from the New York Times, Sky News, BBC. Some people say, okay, you have a good day for us. And we say, you have a good day for us. He has a good story. A lot of people got killed. You look at him and say, no, sorry, I apologize, okay? You had bad day, I had good day. As a Syrian, had bad day, a lot of people got killed. For him as a journalist, he has a good day, he has something to report about. So this is sometimes things happen in journalism. I uh, have to tell you one story. 
One day I was with one guy, his name Richard Spencer from the Daily Telegraph, London. We went to, f to meet one uh, commander, say commander. As soon as we got to his office, we got bombed. So we, all of us were on the ground, the glasses flying all over. And he told him, Richard, we didn't finish that meeting. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and said, yes, sir, we're glad we're alive. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, about the meeting now? Well, some people are a little bit different uh, sometimes. Mm -hmm. can, can I add just one practical um, problem? And maybe you can solve this when you go back. The uh, I was told that before the you know the, the hospitals have been targeted. Uh, Assad has like literally well, he destroyed the biggest hospital in Aleppo, right? Yes. So the hospitals that are left, there's one that's that's mu you know, much smaller. It doesn't have enough supplies, and they have to keep shipping people an hours plus drive away into Turkey. Um, we just happened to be there when there had been an attack in the city and a whole bunch of people were brought in on pickup trucks and taxis and anything that would move, literally, was bringing in women, children, etc. So of course, since I was there, I took my camera out and started videoing and taking pictures. And with, within a minute to two minutes, people started firing weapons in the air and shouting and everyone said, don't take any more pictures. And they explained to me later that because so many hospitals have been targeted, people think that if you take photographs, then Assad will use it to target that hospital. So I said, fair enough, that's a very logical problem. But in terms of, of me telling a story that will move people to action, I need to get into that hospital and I need to film and photograph children who, who have been um, you know, either killed or very severely wounded in what is effectively a war crime. Because if I don't have that, I can d I can describe it until my face turns blue, but no one's going to be moved by it. Okay, um, is there a solution to this? Mm -hmm. Instead of taking pictures outside the hospital and show the doors of the hospital, so if the government agent sees that door, he will know where this hospital is. You get inside the hospital, you take pictures from inside. And this is, you show the trauma was going on inside, but you're not identifying where the hospital is because the government it's regardless for all kind of uh, laws or humanitarian laws they bomb hospitals bakeries every gathering could be possible schools they could uh, when they find a lot of gathering they will bomb it and this is the reason why sometimes we have difficult to deal with it being accused as i said as a spy sometimes because when you take a picture of the hospital and you put news, news, on, news, on your newspaper, the second day the government will hit that hospital, will kill a lot of people there. This is why sometimes they object to that. But if you talk to them in a certain way and you go inside, they will allow you to do that with no problem. Right. right. This, this lead, just one other point. This leads to a larger debate, and I don't want to be the one who sounds like he supports regulating journalists because it's a, it's a dangerous path. But I know that there are being efforts undertaken now to try to screen people who say they're journalists to have some basis of a formal accreditation or something. Um, it scares me if it goes the wrong way, but it could be used to great good if, if, if you had a, something that says, I'm a journalist, and everyone in the FSA recognizes it, and then they can say, okay, you have access. You can go into the hospital, no problem. It's, it's a very dangerous thing to start because it may go the wrong way. Um, we started this discussion like about two weeks ago. I have discussion because I have some kind of moral responsibility about journalism in Aleppo. We discussed with many journalists because a lot of young journalists they go into Aleppo, a freelancer. They know nothing about war, nothing about journalism. Some of them get killed or injured or kidnapped. So we put out the word what we're supposed to do with them, how we can protect them. The question is do we have a moral responsibility to see? to forbid someone 20 years old going inside Aleppo claiming he's a freelancer journalist to let him go to Aleppo and get kidnapped or hurt or killed. We do have moral responsibility, not allowed to go there because we're in no situation. The other things what Paul said, are we controlling journalism? No, we're not controlling journalism. We're controlling a little bit the danger everyone will put themselves to. A lot of young guys, they want to go to war zone to report about one's own war zone because they think it's exciting. It's adventure for them. That's true, but also you put some yourself in danger and you jeopardize our work, our revolution. 
If we hear one journalist got kidnapped or killed inside Syria or inside Aleppo, we'll have no journalist to come in in one month. So that's also affecting us. So what we did, I, we asked every journalist who want to go out to Syria or to Aleppo to have a letter of recommendation plus ID card. I think that everyone can live with. We're not controlling what everyone to do. You are free to whatever to report, but please give us a letter of recommendation and an ID card so now we know someone is responsible for you somehow and you are a really journalist, not you are an adventurer or something. Uh, there were two. You had you had a question and there was somebody behind you as well and then a third. So why don't we just go one, two, three. Yeah, um, uh, wasn't really just, uh, wasn't really a question. I just want to add to what you were saying. Um, the cluster bomb that I was talking about is just, it's uh, pretty sad because when I went, I was actually in Mara, um last December. And um, what happened is that you can see um, I was I was there and then the cluster bomb went down. It was just like, I think, you know, 400 meters away from where I stood. And it took um, a guy with a motorcycle, took away his head and was, was 30 meters away from where, where he was. And the whole motorcycle was burned to ground. And um, on the other hand, there's another weapon that, um, I think um, you know, but you forgot to speak about is the barrel. The barrel, every single weapon that every single weapon or rocket or missile that's used against uh, against any person <laughs> is you could you could just um, go on the ground or lie on the ground, and if you're lucky, the, 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 all the missiles go out. The barrel is the only weapon that if it hits, it hits and it kills. It kills the radius within, even if you're under um, anywhere. If you if you if you base it. I just want to say that because a lot of journalists have been saying that um, the, the regime are actually targeting FSA or targeting Javed um, Musa or targeting the West Al-Hain or whoever they're fighting against. But the reality is that for this barrel, there's nothing that you can target with. If it's in front of a helicopter, open, and they throw with their foot, and where it goes, it goes. There's no targeting method for that to happen. So it could kill anyone in any place at any time. And it's it's so scary to a point that you cannot even describe it. And like you said, like I'm probably a baby journalist, like you said, and I went there for the adventure, but it was not it was not a good experience. It was it was a bad experience. I was almost killed like a million times. I I don't know how to deal with these situations. I went out and like I felt that I went for nothing because when I went out, who would listen? I'm just a 20 years old person who's just trying to go out and, and tell people about it. There's probably two three newspapers that, that talk to me and there are other, um, but before going there, CBC, CTV, and everyone was like, yeah, go, we're going to support, we're going to talk to you, blah, 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 blah. I was in there, I was like, okay, when? They're like, we don't have time, blah, blah, blah. We're, we're sorry, not today, maybe tomorrow. And I was like, okay, like, I went there, you know me, and you know that I was there. I met you before I go. I'm like, oh, sorry, we can't do it. I just want to mention just, just how, 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 how dangerous it is to be there and how bad it is there and how no one really cares unless you're actually a real journalist. And if you're actually a real journalist and you go there, there's a million things that goes through and a lot of people are afraid to be the, the, You mentioned that story about the guy got hit, killed him. His head yeah, cattle. 12, 12, 12. Yes. That bomb. I, I was yes, there. Yes, yes, yeah, that's my village. Yeah. It's my village. That bomb was like, when they used a lot of bombs, for one and a half kilometers. And all this area was cluster bombs. Start from my house, destroyed some part of my house, I went to the middle of the town when this guy got his, his haircut. Like, when I got there, when I got there, they saw me with cameras. And like, I looked white, so they were like, okay, so they thought I was actually a journalist. So they started taking me to the place. And I was like, this is the first second I got to Aleppo, got to Mara. And they started taking me to the place. Imagine seeing your head on the ground, and you have, they were expecting you to shoot a video of it. And then taking you, and then they took me to the hospital for me to see what's happening there. And you see like four or five dead, I think, or like, I think 10 dead bad there, like, 30 injured and you look at it I was like like how could you do this I went out and like I was I was almost crying and the people in the car started talking about it like something that happened like normal it's just a normal thing for them and, and just this 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 just makes me like really hard to hurt from Africa. Uh, I want to mention one thing to this in Alibo there are one one area called the river the river it's a small river run from beginning of Alibo to the end of Alibo Every day, people picking up bodies from the river. The government excuse this, execute these people and they dump them in the river. In the end, we're controlled by the FSA. They will wait for the bodies and every day will pick them up. I went, like one week ago, 
to one area when collect they collect the bodies. I saw like I have pictures with me. I saw like them bodies lying down. After two hours, I left and I went back home. The second day, I, am, I woke up. I'm really upset. Why I'm upset was myself. When I was there with the people to pick up their bodies, their loved one, I never said to one. I never said to anyone. I'm sorry for your loss. For your loved one got killed and you saw his body. It hit me not the first day. It hit me second day. That's become normal to you. You don't really make any, don't make sense sometimes. That's it. It's part of your life. You see every day the people. And this is very bad for everyone. For us as adults, affect us. What about the children? What the fact about the children, the women, the pregnant and everything? This is something we're going to pay for it for the next many years to come. The second generation of the war will pay for it for the future to come. A, a, a quick defense uh, of starting reporters in war, having been one 25 some years ago, the uh, a, a veteran combat reporter said to me, uh, you know, the day you stop crying is the day you have to quit. The point being that the passion that you had and the, the visceral reaction you had to what you saw is exactly what the public needs to feel. Because when they're hearing it from people who are jaded or who wear like the, you know, the, the epaulets and the, or you know, like the flak vest and the helmet and all that phony stuff, it starts to become unreal to them. They need to hear exactly what you felt. They need to feel that. Because then they'll say, stop it. Like I said, I've, I've tried to email, um, I, I believe, more than 400 journalists in, in, in Canada. I got replies before going there. I got replies from over 50 supporting and loving and, yeah, we'll do this, we'll do that. Um, coming back, I was like, okay, so I'm here. What can we do? I got replies from three. And one of them is the embassy newspaper, and um, one of them is actually Jenna here. And <laughs> right. And you know, don't, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm a proud Canadian, but I really think that's a problem with Canada. Don't be afraid to pitch to, to the U.S. and Europe. They'll, they'll take it in a second. Actually, a lot, there's a lot of Canadians who do great work for American publications and European. Voice of America, um, I talked to them and they said, yeah, we'll, we'll be there, but they have the same exact thing. The thing is that they need to, like people look at us as like, okay, I'm a fourth year um, communication. They don't look at me as someone who would actually is able to explain what's happening, and then, but they don't hear, they just see the email. They don't listen to us, they just see the email. But what we've seen, what we've seen like at, 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 at that age, and what people are seeing there at that age, is just quiet, um, like scarring for the rest of your life. Like it's just, if, if, if you could just imagine with me, uh, I'm sorry, I'm probably taking over your time, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. But it's just if you could imagine with me like, just how the helicopter would pass over a village, or pass over a city in, 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 in Aleppo, or in Vinish, or in uh, or in Wilhelm. It's 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 so it's so creepy and scary to the point that you can't you can't even live with it. Like I was here after, and I heard um, a helicopter on top of um, on top of um, like a helicopter just passing over Carlton. I literally um, went on to just went inside the car, and that that's how scary it is. Like it's just. You just see what's happening, you just wait. I think you know the word puppet, puppet, puppet. That word, if I hear it, puppet means it tilted, the plane tilted. And that tilted, it means that it's going to throw something. After it, you hear the whistle. A lot of people say, okay, the whistle, the whistle, and then you hear the explosion. A lot of people say, yeah, an explosion scares, a phone explosion is amazing. If you hear an explosion, you're alive, you're not dead. You, so you've, got, you've got the top of a great story. Yeah. I would read that story. What you just told me <laughs> in the first three paragraphs, I would read that story. Yeah, but, but yeah, but who would just uh, No, believe me, there are. And it, it, people will say no a hundred times. Anyone who's ever got anything published will tell you this. They got a hundred rejections before they got one acceptance. And the one acceptance started their career. So, do, so you know, I don't want to get you killed or badly injured. <laughs> but, but if you have a feel for it, want to do it, don't close. give up. And let's put you guys together afterwards right. to connect and make sure you can follow up. Um, I had two more, and I see another hand. So I don't know if the man in the corner is stretching or wants to ask a question, but we'll do these two, and then I'll come to you. Uh, yes. Do you think minorities in Syria, like Christians, Kurds, and Syria, will be targeted more and more if the number of extremists No, <coughs> I think I'll, I'm, I'm the opposite. On the contrary, you'll be more protected. Uh, the whole uh, regime 
about sectarianism and people being killed Christians. That's total lies and uh, propaganda they use it to be in the same power. Uh, the FSA went to Aleppo in August last year. It's now eight months. One, got, one Christian got killed by some idiot Christ, uh, from the FSA. How many Christians got killed in Aleppo? One. So if this is about going to kill minorities or kill Christians, okay, how come nobody died so far? That's one thing. The other thing is about the Kurds. 40 years in power, Bashar al-Assad and his father, there are a lot of Kurds, they have no passport. They have no right to vote. They have no proper schools. They cannot use their language. So how come government, they care so much about uh, minorities, they give no passport to the Kurds? Or they have no schools? So the whole question about sectarianism, I think that's total propaganda. And if you talk to the Syrian people, they, you will know, you will find by yourself, this is not true. A couple of weeks, weeks ago in Aleppo, they cooked the food in, in church. They took it to mosque to di distribute it. They cooked it in an area called Francisca. It's Christian area. They took it to Muslim mosque called As Sabi, and they distribute to all people of Aleppo to eat. That happened in Aleppo during the war. So the Syrian people they are not sectarian, and no one has to worry about minorities in the future. Unfortunately, you listen to state-run media all and scare people off. They're going to kill you, they're going to kill you, and that's what's happened. Oh, there's one here. I don't see any disadvantage. Uh, but I think Syria, after uh, we get, we will uh, succeed in the revolution. We want to be open, so it's good for us to have an idea about free journalism. It's good to, uh, for us. We try to let journalists operate freely and write freely what they write. So it's good for us. Uh, there are some people. Okay, we're not used to this kind of exposure. Uh, okay, we get some uh, some hospital get bombed or whatever makeshift hospital got bombed because of journalism, sometimes it happened, but it's no real disadvantage of being out of journalists inside Syria. It's the way I see it. Um, yes, this, uh, yes, I do. Because we have different mentalities. So mentality play a big role in war. I know when someone really upset and he's about to do something wrong and maybe you don't notice that. For me, I know how he feels, how he works with his face, with his body language. So I know when he's upset, it's time to leave. For you, maybe find it normal. For that, they come to you as a journalist, okay, help us. We went one day, me and one guy from the New Yorker, his name is Charlie Anderson, he's a very known journalist. And uh, we have an appointment with one Kurdish leader and uh, so he said, okay, I'm running a bit late. Please go to the school, wait for us. I said, okay, we went to school to wait for him. And there was two young guys at that school. We start talking to him and it was okay, everything was okay. Suddenly they asked, one guy asked John Lee Anderson, where you come from? And he told him from the American, from the United States. And this guy got upset. He went inside the school, he got a sh shotgun and came out of us. And he told us to get the hell out of there. John Lee Anderson, he got a bit, Paranoid, or they start to panic. I start talking to this guy. I calmed him down. After that, we walked away. After after that, he said, "Jali, why you don't you leave?" When I told you to leave, I said, "If we left at that time, he will go after us." But by staying there for two minutes, talk to them, him, that will make us better. And so that's what happened. So because I know his mentality, I can deal with them better. This way, I, it's a bit advantage. Uh, Daniel, this question.
Okay. Uh, we have the Ba'ath Party now for 40 years, for 40 years in Syria. If you, if you, ask, you know, like give us roughly estimate from how many people died within the 40 years, you will say over 200,000. 40,000 died in Hama uprising in 82. So if we let 40 years, we have 200,000. Or we rebel with military, we've been, but we have to emphasize here, we didn't pick up arms because we want to. We forced to pick up arms. That's different. And all, if we have paid 100,000 price to liberate Syria and we'll have no dictatorship in the future, that's worth it. Okay? Somehow, somewhere, you have to pay the price for your liberty. And if you take 100,000, we have to pay the price. If we did something, like, for example, 20 years ago, maybe the price would be less. We'll have less people here. Or we did something 30 years ago. We waited too long, and but unfortunately, no one helping us. We got we get killed every day, and no one cares. The other, I ask you another question. All the time you're, you're preaching about freedom and democracy. What are you doing to support freedom and democracy? We you tell me you got killed, hundreds of thousand people got killed, fighting for freedom and democracy. Why don't you support that? Why don't you do something for that? You asking us because we are looking for our freedom? Of course. It's up to you. When you get George Bush to make the United Nations irrelevant and do what he thinks about false intelligence and invade countries, it's up to you to question that and not allow him to do that again or Tony Blair whatsoever. By the way, Tony Blair, okay, is a leader of war in Iraq and against the Saddam Hussein regime, he gets paid now $5 million a year from the Kuwaiti government to be work for the Kuwaiti government. Tony Blair, he get paid five, yes, four, five million dollars he get paid from the Kuwaiti government to work as an advisor to Kuwaiti government. He's the one main player, main player for the war in Iraq, as you know. He's the one campaign for the war in Iraq. So it's up to you to not to have elected some politician like him or to hand him, to hold him accountable for his action. Uh, there's one here. Security measure, you have to have a lot of information. The most important thing is information. Uh, where the FSA are, where the snipers are, who could be a risk to you, to have connections with the people, with the soldiers. So the more information you know, the better you are. Especially in a war like Syria, for example. We went to the old city a couple of days ago, and the old city was one spot like around 50 meters. If you go through that spot, a straight line, 50 meters. But Across that, is on top of the castle, Aleppo castle, there are snipers that can overlook this 50 meters. If you don't know, you have no information, you could easily cross that 50 meters and get shot and killed. You have to go around like 500, 600 meters around, not to pass this 50 meters. So what's important is information and to know what's going on in that area. After that, you go. Did you have to take special, were you worried about security, for example, with your email? Is there some suggestion of people tracking in email the signals? In the beginning, yes. But lately I told them the government doesn't have any more manpower, it doesn't have the technology or what, the equipment to do so. In the beginning, we used to be careful about anything we say between each other. We used to go to houses, inside the houses, put a small paper, what we have to write, and the sign. Someone else will drive motorbike to go to a different house, from different house to different house, just to write a sign. In the beginning, yes, now it becomes a bit easy because it has been liberated and government has nothing to do. And I want to tell you something, for example. Let's say, uh, we're talking about uh, businesses sometimes or signs. We confiscated some listening devices, tracks. Where it's made? In Sweden. Who made it? Sony Ericsson. Sweden until now, I still have the Syrian ambassador in Sweden. The only European country still have Syrian ambassador in Sweden. Why? The Syrian government bought military intelligence equipment from there. Other than that, the, Prime, the Foreign Minister of Sweden, Mr. Karl Bildt, has negotiated an oil deal with the Syrian government on behalf of Lyndon Oil. 
And if you listen and you think about it, Sweden's only country, European country, they didn't uh, report Syria, accept Syria to be reported to the ICC. All European countries, they agree to report Syria to the ICC, the International Community Court, Criminal Court, except Sweden. And uh, this is one example of how things work. Yes, I had a question for you. Yeah, yeah, for um, so, um, yeah, um, you know, so, um, I I think sometimes they are very good because they report things the way they see it. Nothing, they don't have anything behind before. Or they don't have anything in mind to put into the story. They just will, write, will videotape or they will write what they, what they see. This is good. Because a lot of journalists, they come inside the conflict zone, so they have something in their back head, and they will report according to what they have in their mind. Sitting journalists, no. They will go write whatever they see, they have nothing. But this is when they are young, when they become old, that's a different story. I had a question about how you uh, uh, sort of see yourself. So, for example, do you consider yourself, to, would the word rebel apply to you? No. I, for example, I, uh, I disagree with FCA, with they do, Christian Army. Okay, uh, we criticize them a lot. But uh, as a rebel, I, I don't. I have to differentiate between journalist and civilian revolution and military revolution. It's connecting to each other, but not necessary to be rebel, really rebel. It's, uh, I don't know how to put it for you in the world, but a little bit different from each other. Uh, would you ever, have you ever carried a weapon or used no, a weapon? No, I never did. I will never do. This is why I'm a rebel. Mm -hmm. I never bought a weapon, I never carried a weapon, and I will never do. I will criticize FCA. But that doesn't mean I am not supporting the FC. I'm supporting the FC, but I'm not proud. So I'm a bit delicate to do it. Uh, so one, two, three. Um, what the FC say when the revolution start, most 18, 20 years, our guys, they start to go on demonstration. Like me, we, could, we used to stay behind. They control things, tell them to want to demonstrate what signs they put in. And when it become militarized, the revolution become militarized, I did not accept that. I don't want it to be militarized. So it was a bit some kind of rift between us, okay? But we still have some moral authority over them. What we don't like about them acting on their own, for, the, for them, it's different group. They call it the great way of operating. What does that mean? That you see the grief? So if one leader got killed, does not all of it fall apart. You take that spot, still the revolution home. And so, but this has come some danger with it. Every group operates on his own. They won't listen to higher commander or they don't have chain of command. Lately it's been changed. There are some chain of command and some order reserves. You can put it this way.
The first question, okay, uh, if you work with the people, when, uh, with the kids, they start the revolution, and you have capability with them, you stay with them all the time. And they know you, what you believe, you are with them. When they attack our town, we were there. When the military attacked us, we were there. We never left them all. So if you have this kind of capability with them, and sometimes you will criticize them, okay, they will accept it, maybe they will, okay, but they will accept it, and you still have some moral authority. This comes from your credibility working with them for a long time. So you can somehow manage that. But if they trust you, that's it. You're not going to lose your trust by criticizing them. On. And after a while, they'll find out. For example, we try, we, I criticized FSA in the beginning with foreign media. And one of the Tawhid Brigade leader came to me and said, yes, you, you are with us. Why are you criticizing us? I said, well, I criticize you for this reason. He said, well, I will advise you not to criticize us. <laughs> <laughs> and I told him, no, I will criticize you and do whatever you think. So we got this argument. Two months later, he found out what I did was correct. We should be more organized. A lot of crimes happening should happen. So he came and said, okay, yes, yeah, so what we can do now? How will help us? Please help us. So uh, somehow could we work, work this out. The other thing to the state uh, running media, I'll tell you why I quit. One day was uh, the General Assembly in September in the uh, United Nations. And our foreign minister used to be now the, our deputy president, Farouk al-Shara. And uh, they called me and told me, yes, sir, our foreign minister here, please come to cover the General Assembly things. So I went uh, to the General Assembly meetings, and then I have to send to my newspaper what I saw at the General Assembly discussions. The head of his office told me, go to the foreign minister, talk to him, and write whatever he wants. And after that, send it to Syria. I said, no, I won't do that. So I went back to the mission. I want to use their fax to send to my newspaper what I, I was supposed to send. And he said, no, you cannot use our my fax. You use your own fax. So I told him, this is a government thing. It's everything controlled by government. <laughs> he said, no, so I quit. And he said, well, we, you get a lot of pay. Yes, you are. Uh, because when you work for government, such position, they pay you money. They, everyone, you get access to everything. You get, you become like, part of the system. Unless you woke up one day and said, okay, I'm not part of the system, bullshit system anymore, that's it, I'm gonna quit. And he told me, okay, go to use your own facts. I said, okay, that's it, this is the end of it. I quit. So this is uh, how we go to the government. Sometimes we wake up and say, okay, but I can't take this anymore. And, and then do they try to punish your family or anything? My, I didn't, uh, but they punished me. For example, when I used to go visit Syria, I have to go to the Secret Service, report to the Secret Service every time, and that cost me a couple of days of trouble, back and forth, back and forth, until I get back at the top. But my family, my father, they, they punished him one time ago, they kicked him out of the force, because of political things. But every time you go to Syria, you see your name at the border, you have to go to report to the Secret Service, they will interrogate you for one day or two days after that, you need to go. Uh, back here. Oh, sorry. No, you're over. You're again. No, no. Um, I, I just want to disagree with, uh, with the word rebel. I, I don't think the fire there are on the assigned to the world rebel. Like I did uh, like some basic research kind of thing, and you see all over the Canadian and American media the world rebels coming up. Mm -hmm. But the word rebel and, and, and definition is more like um, it's, it's, it just explains how a civil war is against the government against its uh, a, a, a group of that's what rebel is. But on the other hand, you, like they should be called, for example, the revolutionists or people who are fighting for freedom, freedom fighters. Those kind of words, although they sound a bit tied to one side, but they are the real words. We don't have real rebels. We don't have people who are just fighting against, um, like in a civil war. And there's like there's a million, like a million paper that was written here, and they call it um, civil war, civil war, civil war. There's a huge difference between civil war and fighting. Yeah, but you know why they're doing that? Because if they say revolution and not the supporting revolution for democracy, okay, they have to explanation to do. So they call it trouble, they call it whatever, it should them. So we'll have no obligation to do something for that revolution. In fairness, you know, I'm not defending because I see your point. Um, it should be called an armed uprising or a revol you know, revolution. Uh, that's true. 
But the International Committee of the Red Cross, which is sort of the accepted by international law of determinant of these things, has declared it a civil war. So, you know, once once that story is reported, then and you know that this sort of speaks to an earlier point you made about older journalists. Mm -hmm. The um, I'm guilty of this as the next guy. Journalists are always writing that generals uh, have fallen into the trap of fighting the last war. Journalists do the same thing. So when you when you covered the, you know the people who well, I covered um, Kosovo uh, quite extensively, and most of the people who were covering Kosovo had come from Bosnia, which is a totally different situation. The in Kosovo the West was supporting a fascist. Um, mili military organization called the Kosovo Liberation Organization, which just happened to be a convenient weapon to hit Slovan and Milosevic with, but they were fascists. And then they had ended up committing ethnic cleansing and burning, um, you know, Orthodox churches and all those things which are horrible, and paid no penalty for it. The in the case of of Syria, um, you know, a lot of the people who were there just came out of Libya. So the template in their head is Libya or, or Egypt, um, and, and, you know, and then th those ones came out of your, out of Iraq. So uh, a lot of the things you're complaining about are simply baggage that that experienced journalists bring out of the last place. And you know, as people who may be considering <coughs> going into this kind of stuff, you should really try to cleanse your mind. For each new one, so you're not making the mistake of the genuines and fighting for the last one instead of concentrating on this one. Yeah. Okay, so for we talk about civil war. What is it? Civil war. That means civil fighting each other. Right. But in Syria, it's military against civilians. Right. How you can call a civil conflict? It's civil war. It's military against civilian. It's not civilians against each other. So it's definitely not civil war, as that symbol as that. Treaty there, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, I agree, I agree it's, with you. It's, it's a fallible organization, but um, you know, war. You know, we can get into that discussion. Yeah. I'm um, trying to manage war and to and to define it and to apply rules to it. All of that's impossible too. But everyone ag agreed at one point that the ICRC would be the ones that decide these issues, and they've declared it a civil war. So, you know, everyone sort of follows after that, and we call it a civil war. But, but I see your even, point. Yeah, even, I mean, like, what I'm trying to say is that even the Red Cross and the Red uh, Cross that have been sent to the, like, uh, as an association, it actually deals with the people on the ground in Syria. And there's a great example. The Canadian government actually said yes about it. Um, when $2 million were sent to the Red Cross, the Red Cross of uh, International, they were sent to Syria eventually. And the Red Cross of Syria took the $2 million that were associated with the regime and the Canadian government said sorry about it. Mm -hmm. And you can go check out, but no one writes about it. 
you don't see papers written about how the Indian government sends money to the into the Bond NGO. I'm so sorry for taking that. No, no, that's an important point. The Canadian media has completely blown coverage of Syria. The, the you know we were talking earlier. Canada is an important member of NATO, um, but you you would be hard pressed to find a story in the mainstream media about what Canada's position is in NATO on the question of should we arm the rebels? Sorry to use the <laughs> word. Um, I find this astounding. How, how can we claim to be an important country in the world when our public is not even discussing what every nation in Europe is discussing right now? Should we arm the freedom fighters? It doesn't even come up here. I just want to manage the time a bit. So I know I have a question waiting here, a question here. Um, anyone else who thinks that they want to ask a question? So I've got two or three questions left, and then we'll probably come back to uh, Paul and Yasser to, to give us some closing, closing comments. So. I guess I just wanted to kind of a to ask Paul too, because I, I, I think this is an interesting kind of, uh, almost like a problematic, in, in the sense that there, there's, a, there's a moral responsibility that, you, that you're, you repeatedly keep mentioning about you know, being a, a, a journalist. And a, not only being a journalist, but being being an activist in that sense, that you need to be able to criticize where you think something is going wrong, but there's this larger overarching movement for democracy and for freedom. And they, they both kind of operate within each other. And, and on the other hand, Paul, you, you're mentioning this, first of all, this, this call for more of an activist journalism here in Canada, which I agree with, but then you're juxtapositioning, juxtapositioning it against this need for the most sensational imagery that you can find to get the base back home engaged and then to engage their morality. So in the field, you really need to go in with your heart in one hand and ignoring it in the other because you need the most brutal truths you can find. And I'm wondering then, with no access to the regime, right. whatsoever. But, yeah. but let, you've made an important point. The It's incredibly fraught and you don't want to put that power, and it is a power, in the hands of the wrong people. But there are people who can manage that power responsibly. The, um, th the way I always look at this, because it just it's easier for me to visualize it, is photographers. I can stick a camera in your hand, as I had one in my hand in Rwanda, and there, were, there were, was a, a heap of dead children, because someone had walked into a room where they were all hiding in a pile under a blanket and simply killed them all with an AK-47. Now you could stand there and photograph it, and it would be a heap of children with a bloody blanket over them, and nobody would print the picture. But James Knockway or any number of really artistic combat photographers would maybe, for instance, focus on the little hand that was sticking out. And they would make art out of the most horrific cruelty you can imagine. And in the wrong company, that would sound like I'm, like I'm an idiot, but his job is to make people care. So he didn't want those kids killed, but he has the talent and the, and the humanity to make the most compelling picture out of that that nobody will turn away from. And, and there's the key. People are overloaded with information right now, so they're turning away by the droves. They're saying, oh my God, no, 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 another Arab Spring problem. I don't want to hear about it. So it's incumbent on us to think, how do I make somebody care? And that doesn't mean you're going to distort the truth or you know, impose an irresponsible bias or do anything evil. You're simply going to make your choices and write or shoot or do whatever you do in such a talented, human, artistic way that you're going to get people standing up and saying, I want to fix this. And that applies to City Hall, the Supreme Court, House of Commons, everything journalists do. To me, the first question is, how do I make people care? And, and I think just, sorry, just, just to finish this up, it, it, it's comparable to what Mason was talking earlier about the war between Lebanon during the conflict there. So, and with no access to the other side, then you have journalists who are coming in who are foreign and who, like you mentioned earlier, are not citizen journalists, but they're foreign and they're young and they're kind of cowboys, to use that word, or they're coming and looking for the adventure and whatnot. And so I'm wondering on the ground, working in the, your country during you know, this movement for freedom and democracy, how do you then feel when there are these foreign reporters who are coming in? 
and they're coming in, and I think it's there's just a couple points here. I think they're coming in, number one, looking for that big sensational story. They're coming in looking for the adventure. But they're also coming in saying, if I can't get access to the regime, I'm going to get some access where I can be objective. This is my first time. And I'm going to criticize the fight. Because yeah. that's the only objectivity when you can't access both sides is you try to show the worst, but then also be objective by saying that the people who are suffering aren't perfect either. Right. The, I can tell you're absolutely right in the last point because it's always in the back of my head that people are going to say he's gone local. Mm -hmm. He's like totally lost it and he can't be trusted anymore. Yeah. So the quick antidote to, about, to that is criticize the good guys in, in that sense. No, Just no, to show a little objectivity. That's right. right? That's right. You're so absolutely I'm wondering, right. being on the ground, because the introduction mm -hmm. to the, tonight's topic was that uh, this phrase and the, the, the fixer, and, and I remember I was kind of implying the phrase by itself, but, but being a, a fixer on the ground, how do you negotiate that process of saying, okay, I criticize these guys myself, so I get that maybe you're going to criticize them a bit, but there's a larger picture here that we're really trying to fight for our freedom and democracy. I'm wondering how you convey that to foreign, um, like mediators who call, like, act as speaking to us. You, you, don't, you don't talk to him about that. Just let him, uh, just let him see and write what he sees. And if he write exactly what he sees, that's it. You are winning because we have nothing to hide. We are at the right side. We are fighting for our freedom and democracy. So we have nothing to hide. And we do make mistakes. We are not perfect. Everyone makes mistakes. So if he saw an overall things and has something, some bad to. Three bad things with it. There's no problem with that. As long as you see all the story. But uh, I met, sorry, I worked with like over 200 journalists in the last two years. The only guy, one guy, we not allowed to go back to Syria, and I'm sorry to say that. It's one guy from 200 journalists. All what he cared about, foreign fighters and extremists. Was one year ago. And when one year ago was, we don't have too much problem with this. We don't have too much foreign fighters. Every time he come to Syria to Aleppo, talk to me, he what he cares about this. This guy, yes, we forbid him. But if one guy like Paul or those other guys, they come look at this revolution as a whole and see some small things, whatever wrong with it, and report it, there's no problem with that. That's healthy. I, I was going to jump in and say, are there, you know, apart from the, the policy problem, are there just journalists who you can't stand? <laughs> and you won't work with them? I, I, I hope yes, I'm not one of them. No, no, no. Yeah, uh, some of them, yes, some of them, like, uh, okay, we went to one situation, and the journalist was dangerous area. And the journalist, he keep asking the same question over and over again. I told him, you're not doing too good. He looked at me like this. He said, okay, go ask the questions, and I might be happy. I'll be happy to do that. <laughs> so there are some journalists, really, some uh, act different to danger. And uh, they lose it sometimes. That's normal. It's not uh, unusual. It's normal. Some people, they take like five minutes. Half one guy is 20 years old, 22 years old. He worked for European news agency. And he will take him two minutes to ask a question, and he will get one sentence answer. He spent two minutes, three minutes to ask the question. Go over around the question, and he will get an answer, one or two words. So after. Ten minutes, we got five answers, and we got ten minutes of talking. Sometimes these things happen. Sort of not equal, but are the, the quote unquote rebels 
anticipating the disruption of Syria? Um, first, we have to talk about legitimacy. Okay? Legitimacy comes from the people. If the people they don't want to, to be their president anymore, you lost all your legitimacy. You are not legitimate leader anymore. For if we are costing the rebels or whatever, if the revolution costing any damage to the infrastructure, I will give you one story. I have one friend of mine, he used to work for the intelli military intelligence. He used to be in Italy, got killed by a bomb. According to the government, he got killed by terrorists. So the president, we have a law. If you got killed, you're fighting for your country, the president will, will promote you to higher rank. Because his father was pro-government, after they, he buried him, he put a big sign on his door. Said, this is the house of Amin Najjar. He got killed fighting for his country, and the president promoted him to captain. And he put a big sign on his door. When the army came to our town, they burned his house. They burned his house. So if you see the sign, say this is guy who was to work for the government, and the president himself honored him and promoted him, and you come, the military comes in and burned his house. You have an idea of what is, who is doing who, what? So how come someone work for you, die for you, and you go burn his house? And who will go, for example, how are we going to destroy the infrastructure with clashing or with RBJ? Who will do that? Can you destroy schools, buildings, roads, whatever, by clashing code? Until a few months ago, the FSA has only clashing code and some are beaches. Who has a fighter jet? Who has a bomb, the rocket? So that's another lies or propaganda from the government. And I'm sorry, a lot of journalists also listen to that. When they came to my town, they, have, they burned 300 houses. I have a video. They put on the tanks, washing machine and refrigerators and the blankets, and they took them with them on the tank. They used the tank to move the sinks. We have them on video. They went through another town. Another town was a pro government, and they allowed that, that town to videotape them with their tanks and have refrigerators and washing machines and, and their tank. This is a government story, if you think, not us. It's, it's very simple. Very obvious, not to do. I studied international law years ago, so I should know these things, but I don't. But there, there is a checklist. Um, the, uh, you know, it has to do with the the number of combatants, the, the areas areas under their control, uh, and what the definition of control is, that sort of thing. But you reach, there is sort of a sign, not terribly scientific, but there, there's a checklist where you then determine that they've met enough of the criteria that this is now so important. Uh, it, it, that's right, right. Show some, that's right. That's right. That's right. And, and this speaks to the point you just made, in a sense, the, you know, people, you asked earlier, um, uh, should there be an armed uprising against the government? Um, unfortunately, written into that same formula, if I remember it right, is that once there is a, a full-scale civil war, then the, the people uh, who are rising against the, the once accepted government internationally then have legitimacy. They're allowed to you know, they're allowed to negotiate with foreign governments, they're allowed to receive armed aid, all these sorts of things. So written into our international system is actually an incentive to rise up with weapons because you get better rights, you get more rights in the system. And th there's not a great a great amount of international law that supports peaceful demonstrators. I have to just say one thing, one sentence for the Red Cross. The Red Cross in Syria, everyone knows, it's biased not objective at all. So it's no, I don't, I'm not really surprised for, to declare it's civil war. They've never been objective or been uh, even handed. Uh, there was a last question over here. Um, I, I, I mean, can you comment on the state of the Syrian media in general? 
is it generally in the terms of standard that they push the deal in a post SM era to be able to be built be part of rebuilding the media sector regarding the school of journalism? What is the standard of journalism, even though journalists cannot report politically on certain things, but there are certain things that they can report on to do well? Um, uh, first, uh, about the uh, government media. Government media is uh, 100% lies. Including myself, I used to lie. I'm being honest with you. Long time ago, we used to report about uh, electing the president. We used to go to people, take their people's opinion. People who are so afraid. If we, they hear I'm um, journalists coming from a uh, newspaper, belong to the government, they will tell me what I want to hear. <laughs> That's it. And I did that myself for some time. So the government total lies. And I will give you one example of what happened in my town. One time, fighter jet came and attacked uh, potatoes refrigerator. Potatoes refrigerator. It was 10 people offloading potatoes. And they killed seven of them. I was there with a group of journalists like 20 minutes later. Still blood on the walls, everything. We saw the onion inside, the potatoes inside. And that evening, the state TV reported Fighter jet attacked home depot for open storage area in Mara and destroyed that storage area. That's uh, regarding the government. Regarding us, working out with journalists and bringing along foreign journalists to come in and report, report freely, that's part of what we want to do in the future. And what we're doing now, we're sending people, and in the 15th, for example, of April, we're going to have a group of people go out of Syria to Turkey, have training, seminars, and we've been doing this for the last year, training people outside to learn and to know how to report, how to become reporters, and to know about the Western media, to be free, free reporters. So we work on that. We have long time, long way to go, but we're trying to do that. There are some people really believe in the media or in journalism. say something about Syria. We, sometimes we have what's called town hall meeting, you have it here or you have it in the state. And we have some political discussion. And when you talk to the people about the future of Syria, about politics, role of women, role of minorities in our side, we will be amazed how people are willing to talk. They just want to get something out of their system. Talk about politics, discussing role of women, role of Alawites, role of Christians. People they have been 40 years, they cannot talk about anything except look for food and water and something else. So people of Syria, they really were looking for their freedom. And I think they won't lose the opportunity to build or put Syria on the right track if they get the opportunity and success. Uh, I just, I want to invite both of you to uh, just say something in, in, in closing. Okay, I'll start, you can finish. Um, the, because my uh, principal obsession with this subject is the, the role of, of activism in Western journalism. Um, the, sometimes it's easier to look at these things with the distance of history. So I offer as an example the pre-World War II Spanish Civil War. And imagine yourself at this age embarking on a career as a journalist and there is the Civil War going on and it's a war against fascism and most of the European powers are doing nothing to help the resistors against fascism, even though everyone knew it was evil, and that if allowed to succeed in Spain, it would spread, and it would become a plague across the world. And you would have to ask yourself at that time, which side am I on? 
Am I on the side of the fascists or am I on the side of the resistance? I, I can't see it any other way in Syria. You have to ask yourself, which side are you on? Are you on the side of a regime that fires Scud missiles, probably chemical weapons, etc., etc., into residential areas and is committing mass murder every day? Or are, are, you, are you on the side of the people who are trying to build a democratic country? I think the answer is obvious. And then you work from there. You try to control yourself, control your emotions, be objective, get as much facts as you can, and criticize where necessary. But you have to pick a side. Yes? Uh, I think a journalist, being a journalist, it's the most interesting job you could possibly do. But I, I, I stress you have to be morally responsible for what, for what you write. Uh, because it's what you write, it's weapons. The same as any other kind of weapons. If you have no moral behind that what you write, you could contribute to some mass killing or whatever, if it's not now in the future. So watch what you write and be morally responsible for what you write and for the people you write for or for the future of your country too. Journalism, it's very important weapons. Use it the right way. Amen. <laughs> uh, well, I want to thank both of you uh, for being here. This has really been a privilege, and I'm glad we're recording so that others uh, will get a chance to look at this. Because, uh, I mean, Paul was talking about history, the, the advantage of distance and looking back on conflicts. And I just think of, I've looked a lot at Rwanda and the way the media dealt with Rwanda. And what's very striking is there were virtually no Rwandan journalists who were able to do anything. They were dead. Anyone who would try to document what was happening, uh, what government forces and the forces of genocide were doing, was killed. And others were too terrified or literally unable. Hardly anyone was able to actually practice independent journalism during that conflict. So it's as if we have no no way of getting an accurate journalistic record on the ground. So we look at what the foreign correspondents did. And you know, when we're studying journalism and conflict, I think we're guilty of a bit of chauvinism of being drawn to the Pauls who've gone somewhere to report a conflict. And we look at the way journalists go and report a conflict that they're not part of, that it's somebody else's war. So it's such a privilege to be able to hear from someone who is living and breathing this conflict and trying to perform the role of a journalist uh, and help us have that record because who can document this better than someone who lives, lives in this society, understands what's going on, who knows the actors and can maybe help the world figure out what's happening. So, it's just, I'm glad Paul suggested that we hold this event this evening and, and help to make it happen. So I'm so glad that you, we were able to hear from you and to really hear from a Syrian journalist. People can call you an activist if they want, but a Syrian journalist who is documenting these events and helping to create a record that we can, we can go back to. And so I just I want to thank both of you and Yasser especially for, uh, for sharing this with us. And uh, let's let's keep in touch and you know Carlton has done some training activities we've done it in Rwanda we've done it in Kenya and South Sudan and other places so you know maybe we should be like I need another project but maybe we should be trying to figure out how could we set up shop somewhere in Turkey uh, for now and help to run some basic training Paul would be a wonderful uh, that, you know, professor that, emeritus I mean after all the this is not a myth. That is the surest guarantee against extremism winning in Syria that I can think of. If there's an, an army of trained journalists, they'll make sure that's a free democratic society. So thank you very much. This was great. And uh, look forward to continuing to talk to you and hear about what's happening. Thank you. Thank you very much.